from the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. Their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. Our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. And our Batman, the master of tools, gadgets, and all things mechanical, our mild-mannered soon-to-be billionaire, Alan Danvers. Their mission, to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them, and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. Welcome to the Garage Heroes in Training Podcast. I'm going to be one of the hosts for this episode, and my name is Bill. Who else is hosting? I'm Vicky. And I'm Jeremy. Who? Jeremy! 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 Wow. Jeremy's back. I know, yep. it's been a hot minute. You, on, you only come on like after an inch of beard growth, you know? Yeah, every inch, and then I'll be back on. Mm -hmm. It seems that way. It seems that way. So, uh, Jer Jeremy Claus is here. And, uh, Jeremy, we have a guest. A very special guest, from my understanding. Exactly. We're doing a, a home and home series. And, uh, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe he is primarily Honda Challenge, NASA Mid Atlantic. I know him best as host of the Blind Apex podcast and obviously a known podulterer who's cheating on the Race FF podcast because he is an FF kind of guy, but you know, he gets around, shall they say. We have Con Cantart. Welcome to the podcast, Con. Thanks, guys. All right. I'm going to have to make you feel good and, uh, you know, give you the, the same Jaime type greeting. Con! Okay. Yeah. You feel I better? grew up with that. I grew okay. up with that. My neighbor's uh, my neighbor's dad used to yell it out all the time. Every time I popped my head out of the door, so that's awesome. I figured we got to give Jaime a shout out every now and then because you know he needs absolutely the love. he needs the love. So, Con, we give horrible introductions. We have decent backgrounds for our video podcast that nobody ever gets to see, but that's okay. What did we leave out? How would you introduce yourself? For people who aren't familiar with you, as the entity that you are, <laughs> the could entity, be, the entity, yes, could be race life, could be family life, could be professional life, could be whatever. What do you think? Well, uh, I started young in cars, so I've been basically a gearhead, and that's all I am right now. I'm a gigantic child with a bigger budget than I had with my little allowance growing up. Welcome to the party. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. It doesn't matter absolutely. how big your budget is, they can spend more. It, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you could. Um, I'm really strict on budget. Uh, you know, your former guest, Dylan. Ah. Yeah. He and I are, we have two different levels of budget, but we're uh -huh. very strict with our budgets. So, yeah. Dylan's Dylan's pretty well. Well, let me rephrase that. Dylan's pretty hardcore about budgeting, but recently for this year, I think the uh, the the purse spring got a little bigger. Yeah, mm. uh, I think the the stage of having nationals essentially in his backyard mm -hmm. um, sort of uh, loosened up the the locks on that wallet of his, you know, mm -hmm. so. I'm, okay. I, I hope he does well. His aspirations are greater than mine. So, Oh, we're going to get into your aspirations. That's okay. okay. Don't, don't yeah. you worry. <laughs> so uh, what, do, what are you racing right now, sir? I have a 2007 Civic Si for you guys who are not that great with all the Honda acronyms. It's a FG2. FG2. Okay. I got that. It's a coupe to add some more stuff out there for you it's powered by a k20 z3 naturally and, or or swapped no it's it that's what the z3 engine comes in uh, yeah. okay so i run a i run what's called restricted prep in honda challenge h2 class in the nasa mid-atlantic region uh, my 
I'll throw some more out there for you. My gearbox is mostly now out of a DC five type R. So wow. it's as short a ratio as I can get. And I run a ridiculous final drive in it, hmm. which no one else does. Hmm. Well, that, that sounds great. As a German car person, you just completely spoke Greek to me. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds pretty awesome, though. <laughs> yeah, see, you have the, the BMWs and the Volkswagens. And I used to do Volkswagens. I grew up doing Volkswagens. I had a Scirocco GTI. and Oh, the Scirocco. I remember the mm-hmm. Scirocco's. Yeah, my, yep. buddy, my buddy had a Rabbit and... The other one had a rabbit convertible and we, yeah, we were just degenerate Volkswagen kids. Cause you could buy them for like 500 bucks. So exactly. <laughs> I mean, you worked on them every weekend because it was the only way I could get to school and or work, you know, whatever day, whatever day I had off, I was spinning a wrench. So it's a love hate relationship. Uh, right. Yeah. It seems, it seems like everybody works on them every weekend, especially race weekend. Yeah, no, that's why I, I race a Honda now. Mm-hmm. We've gotten ours where you don't have to work on it very much. Mm, I don't know. Well, there's there's a relative of yours that, that says to be doing the same thing, and it, it does not show that uh, tendency, shall we say. Well, let's. that relative likes to use cheap Chinese parts and not listen to what he's told to do. Sounds like a future podcast guest coming on. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine Chinese parts in a Bavarian car would go over very well. Hmm. They're oh, sort excellent. of complicated. So they do know. not go over well and he still doesn't learn. So oh, yeah, well. they're they're semi serviceable unless you're Dylan. Uh they're semi serviceable in a Japanese car. So yeah. I can't imagine a German car doing well with them. We might have to host an intervention podcast for one of our friends. So that's okay. We'll do it. How did you get into racing? My grandfather did drag cars when I was very young. My dad was a muscle car guy. I picked up a really bad habit as soon as I got my driver's license. I got three reckless driving tickets in three months. Reckless? Reckless. 70 and a 45 was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and then my first one was also a federal because I picked it up on federal property. Oh, that's fantastic. <gasps> yeah. And by today's standards, I still wouldn't be allowed to drive a car according to the laws, but I lived in a different time where there were no cell phones with cameras, actually no cell phones at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So back then, you know, page me, yo, and I will find the nearest payphone, waste 25 cents or so and get back with you. But the good yeah, old days, the good old days. <clears throat> and, um, my parents wanted to channel my enthusiasm to go fast, give me some sort of outlet. So in high school, I started auto crossing and doing time speed distance stuff. So the time speed distance rallies, mm-hmm. uh, my mom was like, they're cheap and they'll force you to really realize where you are how fast you can actually go and you have to average that speed for the entire duration, you know, in each one of the zones past speed limit sign, hit that speed limit. Well, if there's a 90 degree right-hand turn, if you go under, you better do the math to go over a little and just try to keep it safe. Right. So I did. And, uh, I enjoyed that a lot. And then I got to Madison Motorsports. We started a college car club at, the James Madison University, my friends and I, and we started volunteering with NASA uh, and going to autocrosses with the Blue Ridge chapter of the SCCA, and it's really been downhill ever since. Mm. Mm. I'll fully understand. Jeremy, come back to me. He's around in space. Yeah. So um, what what do you think your end game or, or your goals are for your racing? I would be happy with a regional or national championship at the amateur level. So racing Honda challenge, I would love to be that competitive. 
I think I race in the fastest region in the United States. So that's a huge challenge. So, uh, wow. they're, they're, they're just fighting words. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we do have back to back national champions in my class from my region. So that if that puts anything into perspective, what I face every weekend is different than somewhat what some other folks will hmm. face. Okay. And uh, we even swept the podium two years ago at Daytona. So all the way out to sixth or seventh, I believe. So the top seven were all from NASA Mid Atlantic Racing Honda Challenge. So, and as the the resident smack talker, I am mm -hmm. the one that likes to point that out a lot and mm -hmm. post on <laughs> Facebook and start meme wars on Facebook and things like that. So, so, so before before Jeremy hits the next question, I just want to. Uh take advantage of your smack talk and and see what your views are on uh socal refusing to get into h2 and staying in h4 so um hot take they're not staying in h4 forever they will not be staying in h4 for the nationals marcel said they are going to try to campaign a single h2 car with the best driver and bring their folks out to crew it for nationals. Oh, so okay. even they have seen the light. You can't, you can't keep racing these cars that you can't find parts for with engines. You can't find parts for with transmissions that they haven't made parts for in 20 years. Jaime, mm -hmm. just stop racing the D series. Jaime, you, you can't, can't keep that up. You guys should learn that lesson fast. He's uh awesome. he's on his third transmission this month, I believe. Yeah, yeah. If you follow him on Instagram, that's that's a fact. He definitely is uh going through them. He's finding them all. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for a D series, you better go talk to him because he's finding all of them. Mm -hmm. They're not working, but he's finding them. Hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like uh someone that we know, Bill. What? <laughs> they, they don't go bad. Right. They sitting don't on my just shelf. pile up. That's right. <laughs> they age like fine wine, exactly. I promise. Yeah, Except until you pull them and realize they're the wrong part. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I was told it was the right part when I bought it. It's fine. <clears throat> it's fine. Yeah, at this point, everybody should be looking to go K-Series or even farther along and go to the L15B turbo car even if you choose to stay in a golden era Honda, my opinion is you need to start looking for new stuff. Hmm. Well, we're going to, we're going to run out of ours and switch to a K at some point. So, some well, hopefully point. at that some point, the K's aren't out of production and they aren't having problems Yeah, because I'll tell you right now, the drag racers put a hurt on the supply of K series transmissions. They blew them up and blew them up and blew them up, and they're hard to come by these days. We'll, we'll do whatever Mr. Honda says. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> so, um, you kind of, it feels like you kind of went into this already, but what made you choose the cars that you chose and or the interest in the cars that you chose in getting into the, into the racing? So... I worked for NASA mid Atlantic as a tech inspector. Well, I started as a corner worker and I was working in tech and my dumb, cheap German car that I bought for $500 blew up again. And I just decided to buy a Honda CRX. And that was sort of my, you know, swan song to all German things. I would refuse to own any German cars now. And I just, I was at the track. I had a Honda. The Honda Challenge family was really opening or really open and inviting. And so I gravitated towards them. I learned a lot and they were a lot of fun. And um, to be honest, when I was working corners, they seemed like the craziest cars out there outside the Ferrari Challenge cars that would show up from time to time. So when you hear them scream to 9,000 RPMs, you kind of want to go do that. I also did motorcycles for most of my life. So high revving stuff is more my style anyway. 
Which would be fun. So, I can get uh, behind that. <laughs> so uh, I like to ask this question. Everybody kind of has something they tell themselves. They're they're on the track. Their motto. Their motivation. Do you have one? My motivation while I'm your, on track. Your, well, your your philosophy, your motto, your motivation saying something that you always kind of return to. Well, if I'm not getting faster, or I'm doing something wrong. And <laughs> let's true. see, I started in 2019. And up until I had a frame rail failure on my old car, I was picking up time every time I went out. I was looking at data. I was talking to people. I was trying new things. And I started to get faster. And so if if you're not I can promise you the guys that are in first place are looking for more time. So if you're not looking for time when you're, mm -hmm. you know, five, six, seven, 15, 20th place, you're, you're going to be there for a long time. So you have to work at it. And that's sort of my thing is working at it. I'm big on my race program. I'm big on trying to get my health where it needs to be. I'm big on really learning my car. I, I literally just dropped the engine in last yesterday. I put the engine transmission in, did four hubs on the car, you know, all in one day, got it almost ready to go. Cool. I just So con, we can't have you on and not talk on a challenge a little okay. bit more depth. Let's, let's, uh, let's get everybody a little bit into uh, how the last year or two have gone for you in Honda challenge. Okay. So two years ago, I, was racing somewhere in the mid pack and every now and then I would have an occasional axle snap in the transmission and which would require me to drain the transmission, pull both axles, knock the nugget of the axle that broke out of the transmission and carry on. So I was carrying several spare axles a weekend. I was spending four to $1,200 a weekend just on axles. Wow. I knew something was wrong, but the problem was I was getting faster still. And I didn't want to take a break. I didn't mm -hmm. want to take an event off and have my car looked at. So a couple of years ago, I was, I qualified at, I was a rookie in 2019. So 2021, I qualified fourth, which in my region is a big deal to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe I qualified fifth and then off the start, I took fourth either way. I could, I was on the bumper of third place at VIR, a notoriously fast track. We're coming down the back straightaway all in draft and they checked up early and I'm like, why are they checking up so early? So I checked up. And then I hit the brakes and I snapped an axle. And this was just before they put the new wall at the end of the back straightaway. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm about to drive straight and collect the first three guys in my class. So I somehow got it slowed down. I coasted into the pits. I came back. I had run out of axles at that point because I was running out of money to buy axles. But no wall, right? No wall. Okay. I parked the car. I turned into a big five-year-old with a five-pound sledgehammer trying to pop the old one out and get everything ready to go so I could throw it on the trailer. And so that was May, March, May, something like that, of 21. That ended my season. The next date for that car was at a local shop, GT Peace, and that's where they found the frame rail failure. Now I race with a guy who's a body guy. He goes, something has to be going on with this frame, you know, that you're tweaking it so much that it's causing this kind of stress. So on the way home, my wife and I planned out, well, what happens if the car is written off? I mean, it's not totaled written off, but that we got to throw away the tub. Mm -hmm. so, so we planned out, it's a four and a half hour, five hour tow home. She busted out the legal pad. She goes, what are the shocks worth? What are the control arms worth? What is the engine and transmission worth? Blah, blah, blah. We make this big list and she adds it all up and she says it's it's worth the, this much money if we part it out. She goes, can you buy a car for that? And I said, yeah, we could buy a car, but 
it'll just be like this one. This car was older. It was a used race car and it hadn't been repaired well. Mm -hmm. So I, she goes, well, what would you do if you had the budget to build brand new? And I said, I'd build an eighth gen civic. So we went through, she pulled up the rules on the phone and she goes, okay, what parts do you need? So I went through, we need LSD. We need to build the gearbox intake header, exhaust, big brakes, cage seat. That's basically it. The rules are pretty strict for this car. So it was sort of cheap to modify more expensive to get into as a, as a base vehicle. Mm -hmm. After we get home, I trail, I trailer the car to GTP. They tell me the bad news. I come home, I start stripping it down and then I hit the internet and I start asking people if they've got any eighth gen civics for sale. And someone out of Louisiana said, yep, we built this car brand new for SCCA autocross and COVID happened. We never got to campaign it. I'll sell it to you for cheap. Cheap is a quotation mark because it wasn't actually cheap, but hmm. it, <clears throat> it came with a diff. It came with redshift double adjustable remote suspension. It came with the intake header exhaust. It came with the tuning system I need. It was basically ready to go. Are the doubles legal in uh, H2? Yeah, it's, I take a 25 pound penalty for it. Oh, okay. That's not terrible. So my wife and I, we jumped into the truck with the trailer. I drove, well, the first place we drove was to Pennsylvania which from my house is the wrong direction to go to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But I had to pick up a car because a buddy of mine bought a car and he was going to pay me a pickup and drop off fee for that car in North Carolina that would cover my gas for the entire trip. So I took it. Yep. Uh, you know, if you're going to pay me for my round trip gas and I only had to put one tank of gas to go get this car, I'll take it. That turns my Louisiana trip into one tank of gas. Yep. So that's easy math for me. Uh, the next stop was a tractor supply. I have an open trailer. It's built off of essentially anything you can find at tractor supply. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it was professionally built, but all the replacement parts are there. So I grabbed a couple of spare tires, grabbed, I had a tire changing kit that I put up. I always bring to the track with me for the trailer and off we went. So we dropped the car off in North Carolina and then we were somewhere in Monroe, Louisiana. And when we picked up the new car, so Hey, that's where my wife lived. Yeah. Hmm. Should have picked I know up that area Jeremy. very well. I know. I know that area very well. Had I only known. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can tell you this one, especially with an open trailer and no load on it. When you get, say, outside of South Carolina, when you're going to hit the Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama area, and then into, into Louisiana, mm -hmm. the roads are terrible. It's like we carpet bombed the United States and then we forgot to fix it. Like, Sounds so. like Pennsylvania, too. Oh, no, Bill, they're much worse. Oh. Great. I know. I know exactly what he's yep. talking about. No, I it's open trailer through there many, many times. You okay? So it was so bad that it tried to rip the fender off of my trailer just from vibration. the The roads yep. down there are terrible. So we buy this car. We spend a night. I'm paranoid, so I have like wheel locks on the car. I have wheel locks on the trailer. I have multiple locks on the tongue. Where I leave it at at the hotel, we go have a fun night out. We come home, we block in or come back to the hotel, block in the the car for the night with the truck, and then the next morning we iron butt the twelve hundred miles home. Wow! Hmm. So, and then I started taking the car apart. I got scheduled for cage time with Piper Motorsports here in Virginia. They build excellent cages. He built a custom one for me. And then I had back surgery. So while I was building my car, I had surgery on my lower back. 
Ouch. Which meant, which meant my wife and my dear friend Jason had to basically fix the car, do everything they could to the car. So, you know, paint the cage, install safety equipment, modify the dash. I couldn't get in and out of the car. It was, mm-hmm. I don't know, like six weeks. But I was bound and determined to make the first event, which I did. So in 2022, that was my first full year with the car. I ran four events. I progressively got faster. Uh, I learned a lot about this McPherson strut business. It's terrible. It turned my $1,000 tire budget into a $4,000 tire budget. (laughs) It has Uh, a way of doing that. Yeah. It's really hard on tires. We made more changes this off season and we're ready to get back at it. So, you know, I I mean, I just want to tell you, Con, that the, uh, it wasn't necessary to get the back surgery to have your wife fix the car. I mean, I've done it. I can tell you how to do that offline. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is my crew chief. She doesn't like to do it, but she is the one. She has the checklist and she's like, did you check your pressures? Did mm-hmm. you torque your wheels? Do you have your gloves? Do you have your Bella Calava? Did you put your socks on? You know, is the cool suit on? You know, did you? put ice in it like she goes down the list did you remember your underwear basically and usually i don't so yeah. <laughs> so is 2023 back to the grind for you or getting getting more involved back to the racing or is, is still ramping up oh no we're we're gonna go full steam ahead i have partners that i work with they love to support me i really appreciate them so i need to get out there and prove some stuff to them Mm -hmm. i'm currently prototyping a set of brakes for the car because they don't make them i'm currently fixing what people use to put splitters on the car because they don't actually make quick distant disconnect splitters for our cars so Mm. i'm kind of making up my own system off an off the shelf unit yeah we're going full bore it's the nationals is on the east coast so it's time to party a little this year that's awesome can't wait to go watch that yeah it's going to be exciting i don't believe the car count is going to be the same i'll be honest uh all our entry fees are up 20 ish 25 percent in some areas so that's going to hurt people's budgets if they're going to nationals, they're probably going to do the minimum number of races to go. Right. Uh, if they're not going to nationals, which by the way, nationals hasn't released the pricing for nationals yet. It's usually out by now. Usually could sign up already. Mm-hmm. Might be a telltale sign of what the pricing might be. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, I know Jackie from the Northeast has said, you know, 30 to 40. That's a very ambitious number. I think Dylan is hoping for 20 to 25. I think that's more realistic. But I think we may be in the 15 to 20 category, really. Really? <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm on the 40 plus side of the world. So we'll see. Yeah. So uh, what do you think the strength and weaknesses are of the current eighth gen Civic versus what else is out there? Um, in, in our rules, Mm -hmm. the car, the car can make weight pretty easily for the engine that it has. Not all cars can do that. I'll tell you that, um, a lot of guys struggle to get their car within say 25 pounds of minimum weight. It usually takes them two or three years Mm -hmm. to find that all. This car is pretty easy to find weight and get it out. It has the K20 Z3, which is a massive amount of torque. Wait, a Honda? For, yeah. I mean, torque for a Honda? Torque for a Honda, yeah. But I, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Not E46 torque, no. But because we, <laughs> we had to poke that in there, I'm sorry. I was listening to dominating with Dawson. The last one, I think it was released today. And all I could think was 
there's literally a number for a front wheel drive car where you can give all the gas at the apex. You have a torque number with our comps. Uh, in my car, I'm above that number by a lot. So I don't feather Vicky. Don't feather. feather I roll, pad. roll in. Uh, yep. And you have to learn the pace of your roll per corner or it will absolutely smoke the tires off the car. So it has gobs of power. It makes it early. It makes it often. I have to detune the car. If it were GLTC, I'd probably be taking a penalty for the flat tunes. So that's, that's a good a problem to have. Yep. It, it is a good problem to have, but I will tell you that we don't get bump steer kits. We don't get angle correction kits in my class. And this car, its biggest weakness, in my opinion, it has no suspension travel. Jack the car up. It'll sag an inch, inch and a quarter. Compress the car as much as you can. It goes up maybe an inch. So I have two and a quarter, two and a half inches of total travel. And the rear of the car has a point where if you go too low or too high, that it changes the dynamic toe out on the rear as it, mm. as it goes through the motion. So it's really hard finding the correct ride height. Um, the big, the big bonus is everybody tells me is, Oh, but you're on 17, 17s have like the rolling diameter. It's better for the brakes. You get bigger brakes underneath it. I don't argue that, but with a McPherson struck car, I'm pretty much stuck with the camber that I can beat into the car. I don't have a toe, uh, sorry, a camber curve for compression. So it sort of, I think it evens that out. Hmm. Um, but some people think it's the hot ticket. It's a good car. I won't lie. It's, it's not a bad car. Um, I think there's better cars because in Honda challenge, they're balancing. It's sort of, it's sort of like Grand Am, but for Hondas only. Mm -hmm. So, you know, TCR has a lot of different makes and models and they want to balance them. Oh, the type R gets this much weight and the other car gets that much weight. Okay. That's exactly what it is for Honda challenge, especially in H2, but we're limited by engine maker essentially we're we're a honda specific group mm -hmm. we balance every car that way mm -hmm. so i think it's pretty balanced i i know there's time in it i know there's time my data says there's time i could be up front so i'm not really asking for anything in the rules right now okay i mean i am but that's because i'm trying to i know where the hole is it's not my car and somebody else could do it and I want to stop that because I don't want to deal with somebody overpowered. But mm. yeah, I could see that. So what what do you, what are like the uh, the cars to beat in H two right now? Well, is it the S two thousand? I mean, uh, one of the guys, Baker, the twenty twenty two national champion, he would tell you that in H two. The S2000 is the car to beat. We consistently are faster than that. Well, we, he is consistently faster than the S2000 that does show up for H2. Mm -hmm. um, it has the S2000 has gobs of power. It's a straight line monster. Um, the rules really limit its suspension. So it's not that great. I believe the car to beat is a DC5 or sorry. A B eighteen C five DC two Integra, so in Type R Integra powered, any one of those chassis will work. Hmm. So an LSRS GSR Type R, as long as it's powered by the DC or sorry, the, as long as a DC two chassis and it's powered by the B eighteen C five, the Type R engine, you'll be fine. Hmm. That's the easy button. It's the expensive button. I had one in my old car, which was an EM one. <laughs> That's a coupe for the non-Honda people, a newer coupe. 
not as new as my car, my current coupe, but it's a nine, it was a 2000 coupe. I sold it for five grand. So just the engine. Wow. And it wow. went, it, it went into a chump car of all things, champ car, chump car, whatever. And now they have, I don't know, 60 something hours on the engine after I let it, let, after I, you know, sold it. So hmm. that's pretty good. So I know that you said that this year, it seems that the amount of people signing up is a lot smaller, but like, let's say last year, what was the average entry for any particular race throughout the season? So last year was a light year for us as well. I think in the Northeast, they were getting 15 to 20 car count and we were getting between 10 and 15 with the potential to get to 20, depending if everyone showed up. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're getting, you can get that 30 to 40 because we eat each region easily has 15 cars, right? Just from the Northeast and the mid Atlantic. So it could be a huge shootout if we can all get there. See, we, we usually go to great lakes and that was where we did a lot of our training and there's just no Honda challenge out there. So it was, it was new to us when we started coming back to the Northeast. Yeah. The dichotomy between the regions it's been weird. So like you said, Jaime and the guys in California race, race H4. They actually took H2 cars and went backward in speed. Right. Some of them have their H2 stuff laying around. Some of them sold it, you know, but there's stuff around. It's California. There's lots of Honda stuff there. They could go to H2 if they really wanted to. In Texas, I believe the Texas region, their current group of Honda challenge cars used to be super touring cars, which are, that's a multi-class racing point mm -hmm. system, just like time trials would be, but then you're, you're door to door. Right. And then they decided to make the change to Honda challenge. Great lakes, I believe has Michael Baldridge is the only Honda challenge guy out there. And I don't, I think he runs an ST sometimes just to get tire points. Mm -hmm. the southeast they're weird for whatever reason the southeast had a bunch of s2000 guys right and all the s2000 guys nobody wanted to take the parts off their car to be h2 cars because you know you're you buy s2000 you go to the track probably the first thing you're going to do is put big brakes and some kind of pimpy shock on there right motons penske something cool right mm-hmm well, you can't run that in Honda Challenge H2 with S2000. So they're all H1 cars. They do have a small H2 contingent that's growing down there, which is good. It's good to see. I stalk basically every region on Race Hero. So I'm always looking to see mm -hmm. who's coming up, who's getting fast. Mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic grew for out of a bunch of guys who were just friends. They actually became friends at the track. They were like, hey, you have a Honda. I have a Honda. That guy's got a Honda. Let's hang out. Let's drink beers in the evening. And they kind of revitalized Honda Challenge here. Mm -hmm. It was dead in the mid-Atlantic region for a long time. Basically, from the time that NASA Nationals went to Toyo as the spec tire for Honda Challenge, mid-Atlantic region disappeared. They said, we don't want any of that, any of that mess we're at different points in our lives. We'll just stop racing because that's not the kind of racing we want to do. The Northeast, Jackie, Zephyr, they've always been around. They've been around since in early 2000s. And so they've just been able to reach out to the Honda kids that are coming up. I say kids, it, they're all ages. The Honda folks that are driving in HPD and mm -hmm. been able to grow that class in in the northeast and they right. have h1 smaller h1 group and then a quite large honda challenge 2 group mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it helps that their h4 cars all converted up to h2 so that's why their h2 field is so big yeah because yeah. i think they had five or six h4 cars so i think dylan was h4 until not too long ago yeah he definitely was he actually dabbled in h2 he would come down he came down to summit point, took all the lead out of his car and tried to hang with us in H2 at summit. So cool. 
He's wanted to go faster for a while. I think we all want to go faster. Exactly. We'll I'm actually good. I don't need any more speed because it just, I, I look at my tire bill and I just shake my head. <laughs> <laughs> this is Seriously. enough power. I'm going in fast enough. Yeah. I don't need to eat more consumables. I may be right. eating mm. too many consumables right now. We'll see. Well, at least you're not doing axles anymore. Right. No, that so, four hundred dollar bill went away every weekend. Thank God. That's good. That's really, really good. So come on, car. I know it's fairly new to you. You've got one good season on it. You've got another season coming up. And you said you're pretty much ready for it. Are there, other than, you know, your issue with the suspension, is there anything else that you really need to you know, change on the car that you're looking forward to modifying or, or fixing or, you know, that kind of thing. Like, is the car good? Do you want more out of it? Like what's, what's oh, your the, plan the for car, the progression of your car? The The car is reliable, assuming I don't ham fist the transmission. So one weak point that I covered in a, in a podcast was the transmission I was overdoing a K swap, but Essentially, with a K-series engine, you guys should learn this, you cannot ham-fist shift these cars. They are very fragile shift forks inside. Mm -hmm. And I was I was actually in second place. And I was counting down. I looked at my Garmin. I saw what time it was. I knew I had maybe six minutes left in the race. And I go to shift into fifth gear coming into turn 10 at summit point the car doesn't go into fifth gear i drop it into fourth gear i bounce the rev limiter all the way through turn 10 i go back to find fifth it's not there i go to put it in sixth and just go i'll coast this thing i'll drive it as a three four six car i don't care just let me get towards the podium right yeah and then it stopped going into all gears so I actually carried enough momentum around to where I got to the carousel at summit point. I slammed it into third gear and I got it the rest of the way home, not in the race, but into the paddock. Mm -hmm. The car outside of that lesson learned, don't jam the transmission when it doesn't go into gear. Just take your loss of that so you, shift. So you mean all the videos you but be doing that, that doesn't help or make you go faster? Absolutely not. Uh, oh. <clears throat> I'm doing it, it, it may save you. Let, hypothetically, it may save you that one second because you got it to go in gear that one time. So it'll save you that one second. But later on, it's going to cost you. And it's going to cost you a race. Because it did to me. It'll cost you qualifying. And I don't know anybody outside of me who carries shift forks. Now I carry shift forks in my spare. <laughs> not that I do it, not that I would know how to do it or would be willing to do it. I've done a lot of stuff track side, but I wouldn't do that. Not without some help and some encouragement, but mm. the other weakness with this car is I'm trying to get it to turn and I'm. There's a wheel in the left-hand side. It's, it's, it's... Yeah. 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 When you turn it, it just, when you turn that wheel, it doesn't always turn. So I'm limited to an eight inch wide wheel. So I'm trying to run a 235, 40, 17 square setup. Doesn't seem like a lot of tire. I can't fit 245s square on the car. They won't fit in the back. So, and one reason I want to is because I rotate my tires every day at the track mm -hmm. and I still only get two weekends out of a set of brand new tires they now don't heat cycle out go. they they're slicks you're running toe in in the rear correct no in a no. front wheel drive car you're running toe out in the rear i'm gonna run as much toe out this year as humanly possible so whoa let me let me teach you a little bit I, new I, front wheel I, drive must be, people it must be a lot than than Volkswagens. <laughs> so you need to, you need to measure on an alignment rack, if possible, 
the toe changes as the rear of the car goes through its motion. So if my car had sphericals, which it doesn't because nobody makes sphericals for this car, not in the rear, not yet, it would likely not have this issue. But what happens is as I load the rear, as I compress the rear, it toes in naturally so if i tow in it toes in even more it's not that great okay it all okay so right last year i ran zero toe i won't lie i'm a big chicken i'm deathly afraid to toe out everybody says it's magic it works wonders but when i watch <laughs> their videos their hands move like my i'm old I, my hands don't move like that i i use an extra small steering wheel people laugh like they're like, oh, I have a, a three twenty mil steering wheel, or I have a three ten. I'm like, no, I have a two seventy. Wow, it's a flat bottom two seventy because wow. I want every movement to count. So and it has to count as fast as it can, and that's the only way to do it. Get the smaller wheel. You're one step away from having a knob on that thing, sir. I'm working on it. <laughs> hey, I got a <laughs> You're more than welcome to. It's a beautiful flat bottom Sparco cartwheel. You could throw that. There. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's. I think it's the smallest one Sparco or OMP makes. I'm not even sure what wheel it is. Probably a Sparco wheel. No, a Momo wheel. But yeah, so that's that's one of my biggest complaints with the car. I need to if Jackie says, and she's probably right. If I can get it to turn in initially a little better, it'll probably keep me from turning the wheel so much and save the tires a little more. Mm -hmm. And if that, yeah, I, I mean, it makes sense, right? I understand it. I just got to make the car do it. You know, mm. last year I bought a very rare sway bar for it. Mm -hmm. I had to wait nine months for it to come to me. Wow. They're not plentiful because nobody races these cars anymore. The rumor is all the eighth gen civic race cars that were built for, you know, the pro level racing, like T TCA cars, mm -hmm. they were all purchased by someone in Dubai for his personal racetrack. Ah. So they don't exist anymore. All the parts that HPD make made for the car. They were all on those cars, in the spare boxes, all gone. There's no more race ABS available. And it really killed the parts production for that car. So when you order, I ordered an ASR hollow bar and it took me nine months to get it. So, and there's probably a dozen in existence right now. So that's how few people run it. That doesn't sound like fun. Hmm. So yeah. what is your what is your upcoming schedule? Do you got a get a national prep plans? You got stuff going <laughs> on? I definitely have things going on. I will highly likely not be at the crossover event for, in July. In July, yeah, I am not very fast, and I will not show my hand if I am very fast. So I will not be testing at pit where somebody can see what my time is. It's gamesmanship. It's part of a race program. People will learn to get over it. That's what my feeling on the matter. I don't know anybody. Maybe I, I've talked to the guys that I think are very much contenders and they're of the same mindset. And if they did go, they'd sandbag. Hmm. So, but I'm looking to run at least the first three events with NASA mid Atlantic. So that will be the VIR March opener would be April at summit point. And then everyone's favorite hyperfest in May. And then I will evaluate where I am in speed versus the guys I know that already kick my butt mm -hmm. to see if it's worth going to nationals for however many thousands of dollars it's going to be to get up the turnpike and go race. Mm -hmm. And if it's not worth going to pit, I will race the entire mid Atlantic schedule and try to steal a regional championship because no one else will be racing it. Hmm. Well, there's that. 
I, there There's will be people racing, but yeah, yeah, no. the really, really fast guys, they probably won't be there. Well, if you need it slowed down, we can come on down. We'll, we'll take care of slowing it down for you. <laughs> <laughs> I do that w- well enough on my own. Um, yeah, but I've got gotten least, a lot better, so you've, you've got at least a proper toy. We're still, uh, we're still looking at the, uh, the D series, so. I think we're outgunned. I, you have enough parts. You could just sell everything for a thousand bucks a pop, and then because <laughs> they're so rare these days. And honestly, D series stuff. So I bought a Honda in two thousand, two thousand and one. That's when I bought my CRX, mm-hmm. and it had a D sixteen A six. And at that point, the only reason people would buy it is because it was the motor to have in a Honda in SCCA ITA cars. So I sold that off. But generally speaking, everyone else I know with like a D16, Z7 or any of those motors, they couldn't give them away. They wanted them out of the garage and nobody wanted them in the garage. So most of them went to the metal metal recycler. And where I used to live, if you got the right guy, he wouldn't even notice that the sleeves were steel. He'd just stick a magnet on the outside of the block and then give you aluminum weight for the entire motor. Mm -hmm. So people were making money off of it. I I would pick up free D-series from people. Come get this. Okay. And then I'd wait for that guy to be at the recycler. And then I'd go home and load up the back of my CRX with, you know, three or four blocks and then he'd stick a magnet on the aluminum be like it's aluminum and weigh it all hmm. and i'd make good money so because right now we're doing uh we have one d16 z6 and we've got three d16 y8s okay so oh, that's plenty they're gonna last forever except the distributors yeah and we the have transmissions. lots of those oh we have three transmissions okay Maybe so we're, we're good for until a little you bit. turn three transmissions into one. Yeah, you break the same part twice. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what this weekend is. We're we're taking three and hoping to get two. Okay, we'll see. Well, we have four technically. Well, call Jaime and he'll ship you whatever. Whatever's broken. <laughs> whatever's broken. Yeah. <laughs> so. So what? So what are you thinking? You're you're on the sub two minute. Uh, projection for pit race right oh yeah 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 that's cooking the, the well they're on I'll slicks though jeremy so we're, we're we don't do slicks so we have no we're idea not, the toyo rr is not a slick a Mm-mm. a re71 the a07 the good the pointy field the the gltc band 200 treadwares mm-hmm. smoke smoke the Toyo RR. There, yeah, we don't race those either. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah, no. But you figure most of us are we're in the like 13 to 1 power to weight ratios. We we fluctuate between high 13 to 1 down to 12 to 1 in our class. Mm-hmm. So but the guys that are racing these cars, we have a lot of time in them. And they've been raced for a very long time. So these chassis are developed, not mine per se, but mm-hmm. the DC2, the EG, the EK, the EM1s, all the variant, the EJ2s, they're, they have all had plenty of race hours on the cars alone. There's no new builds. And then that generation, that chassis style has been around long enough and raced enough that everybody knows what to do. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be fast. And you have two large regions, what I call large, large for Honda challenge. Right. So my, one of my big theories is when you're racing in a class that has a lot of people, you guys going to do TT and Sunday cup, Mm -hmm. you are going, you're forced to be faster. The more people you have in your group, the faster everybody goes. Right. There's only one rabbit on track and that's whoever's in first place and then everyone else is a wolf and they'll eat each other to get to that rabbit. 
And that's how racing goes. And it doesn't matter whether you're 17th out of 17, that guy in 16th better watch out because you better be working to get past him. And it, that progresses all the way up the line. And I know in my region and I know in the Northeast that the podium guys, they're always working. So they're going to run a little faster. You better have to work too. And it's, it's, it's also a big family. So we help each other. I'm not going to tell you 100% of the solution. I'll give you a 90% solution and make you think of the other 10%, right? Right. You, you should have that capability and they do and they will. The guys get faster every year, every Mm -hmm. event, Saturday to Sunday. It it almost doesn't matter, especially in the back end of the field, back to mid pack. When weather changes between Saturday and Sunday, I bet you the back and mid pack get a little closer. That's when you'll see the front pack gain a 10th or two, and you'll see mid pack gain half a second. And you'll see the back of the pack gave gain seven tenths, right? right? Everything gets much, much tighter when the front doesn't find more time. And then we get, we mid pack backpack people like me, we get more experience racing because when you're by yourself and when you're in, in groups that are very few, when you're in a race group with four people, you don't understand race craft and it'll come bite you. Right. It really will. Prime example he probably, well, he probably listens to your podcast and he ignores me all the time on Facebook, but the, the guys out of Texas, they came to race at Laguna Seca and Baker, Jonathan Baker, mm-hmm. um, he qualified third, I think. Well, the Texas crew left the inside of turn one, basically open on the opening lap. You know what that says? They don't they're not tight enough racers and Mm. Jonathan barged all the way to the front on lap one and didn't look back. That also says that you don't know that track either. Well, they didn't know it. Nobody knew it. No, nobody from Texas and mid Atlantic. They'd never raced there before. The best they would get is some sim time, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't think, well, you, you just can't, you, you can't leave that much open without checking your mirrors. So if people are that close, you better tighten it up. But mm. yeah. this they was didn't. over at Laguna, right? Yeah. Laguna Seca 2022. If, if you watch Baker's video first lap, they throw the green flag and he barges right to the front by turn one. And he never looked back. Mm. So oh. in terms of the front runners, this, this, Baker guy, he's one of the one of the front runners, I assume. Yeah, Jonathan it, Baker, he runs a, a Type R with he has various engines. He's been racing for a long time. Christopher Michaels, he's in my region. I would say Dylan, Leland, a lot of guys out of the Northeast, they they've got a shot at it. It it helps that out of the Northeast. It it hurts and helps. It helps us. It hurts them that Ronnie is going to go to GLTC next year with his his Integra with the new DC Sports support. Mm-hmm. So, I was just going to ask you. I was just going to ask you if you knew my buddy Ronnie. Yeah, it, to be honest, one of the reasons he probably isn't doing Honda Challenge is because the motor he has isn't actually legal for Honda Challenge. So, right, you know, that's actually the hole in the rules I'm trying to plug. So. Ronnie, uh, Ronnie's a very good driver, Bill. I think you've met him, Bill. Not on the podcast. You're doing a poor job of producing. No. Hey, I, 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 I've got him on and also another friend of mine that 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 races. Uh, he's going to be coming on too. Uh-huh. Nick Bar mm-hmm. Nick Barbado. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Ronnie, Ronnie will definitely come on now. He's he's on the hook. He's got a big title sponsor of the car, so he's got to tap yep. them somewhere. So he'll definitely. Yes, be he on. does. Oh yeah, he'll be on. Yep. So he's he's one of the front runner. If he was racing, he'd be one of the front runners. You're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ronnie would Ronnie would be up there in my region. We have Morgan and Holden. They're also pretty fast. Brent's pretty fast. So we have we have a solid top five. And I think the Northeast has a solid top four. 
And if I go, if I crack the top 10, I'll be happy where I know Dylan said, if he was in the top five, it, it would be successful. But that's mm-hmm. in my opinion, that's a dream for me because top five in my region is hard enough. So, so, right. so you're looking for a top five this year? No, that's Dylan. I'm looking for a top 10. <laughs> I'm at 10 yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I uh, if, if, pit race has elevation yep it and does so i love motor, that track motor selection is going to be important i mm-hmm. i've never i haven't driven i haven't driven at pit since it was upgraded so mm-hmm. it, i drove it 2004 three oh. something like that so i don't i essentially haven't driven pit it has but I all hear, the grip in the universe it does all of it. Well, I mean, that's, that's great. And that's going to be great for our class, but what it's going to do is make passing much harder. So, and your tire budget's going to have to increase for pit race. I can tell you that just for that one weekend. Yeah, that's true. Oh, it's hard on tires. Yeah. It's, it, it has really all the grip in the world and it will destroy a set of tires very, very quickly faster okay. than any other track I've been on. Okay. It, have you been to CMP? It was no. It was like old CMP. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. I mean, that's fair. It's yeah. a good warning to anybody who's listening who's going to Nationals. That doesn't help me out cuz my $4,000 tire purchase is a little bit much. Yeah. But we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great track. It's got all the grip and and your your lap times don't vary that much from wet to dry, you know. As as long as it's middle of April, that's a little different. But like middle middle of the summer, normal weather, you know, temperatures out, your lap times don't vary that much, wet to dry. Okay, yeah. So one of the things I was going to do is do an early cider, go find a a weekday rental HPDE whatever at pit go. Heck, auto interest they have a bunch out there. Last time I yeah. looked. Yeah. So hit them up and then basically just run my internal data and be happy Mm -hmm. Uh, and do that early on when everything's fresh on the car somewhere before Hyperfest. And then the plan would be somewhere closer to nationals when the weather is more apt to be similar to nationals, go and do more just in case I need to change Ma- do major changes to the suspension mm. to make it work there. So we'll see. It's an amazing track. I love it. It's one yeah. of my favorites. I heard it's great to drive. I heard it's not that fun to race on. So I'm hoping that changes. I disagree. I raced on that track a lot. Well, okay. So for the folks going to nationals, where are the best places to pull a pass? One, two, yeah, one, I, I think one, one going into two is probably, that's a sneaky, and if you want to really understand that corner, Randy Pope's got a great video on that corner. It's super sneaky. You can carry way more speed than you ever think is possible through that corner. Down into what I like to call the bowl, which I think is what, five, Bill? Five mm-hmm. six, yeah. It, Five, it's six. not. It's not a great passing spot, but if you do it wrong, it's a tremendous passing spot that you will be passed in. Because yeah, yeah, you need the torque. You need the torque to get out of there. So you, you really have to make that right. And if you do, you can you can get out of there. Okay. And then uh, twelve thirteen, on the whole, through the whole back, you can you can do it. The S's are tough. Yeah. I agree. The S's are tough. Yeah, the S's are tough to pass because you're all going to be bumper to bumper. I you mean, swing. just cranking, yeah. So, but there's there's three really good passing zones, and you know, one's more of a defend, but uh, it's it's fun. I I like that track a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay, we we race in places in the Mid Atlantic where there's kind of open season. Yeah, VIR. There's a lot of passing. You can do mm-hmm. a lot of passing in a lot of places. Summit Point, outside of the carousel. With the carousel, sounds like the flat S's or five six. If you mess up the carousel, mm-hmm. you're hosed. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, um, if you if you don't 
at some point, if you mess up the carousel, you're going to get your lunch eight going up through nine because it's an uphill right-hander. So if you're not carrying the right amount of speed, you're in trouble. And that leads you into 10 and they get inside you on 10 and you know, you're going to have to back out. So, yeah, we haven't messed up VIR yet. We will. We're going to talk about VIR in a little bit. Oh, awesome. Let's do it. VIR. Yep. So, so we kind of touch on this just a little bit, but uh, what do you think for pit race? Is there a, a car or chassis or engine favored just by the site? Yes. So my opinion is the DC2 chassis alone is overpowered by itself. Mm-hmm. It is the double A arm cars can be run lower and they can be, they're narrower and shorter naturally than the hatches. There aren't very many coupes out there. <clears throat> they're very pointy. So any of the high speed stuff, they don't, they don't have a lot of drag. Mm-hmm. Even the, even the hatchbacks have a problem where they, they can't catch a draft off of those cars. Mm. And if that car is paired with a K K motor, specifically the K 24s, I know Ken's car wash runs one. I know Brent runs one. I don't know what Leland's going to run next year, but, uh, out of the Northeast, but the K 24, assuming you can get the gearing, right will have all the torque you could ever need to climb out of anything. So, so that's, that's the one you're thinking has a, a little bit of an advantage. Home view. Yep. A DC two with a K 24 engine mm. should be, should be the easy button. Easy button. I like easy buttons. Nobody else likes easy buttons. I like, easy Hey, buttons. Bill, why are you getting him to tell all the secrets on this before this stuff's coming up? We are hard hitting news journalists. <laughs> that rock we've had this conversation in our paddock area for a while i mean we were we were watching baker win at laguna talking about pit because it had already been announced and about what car would be best i'm a little biased because i run a car that's a inch and three quarters wider and almost that same amount taller than everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I don't get a draft off of anyone, but your truck and trailer could draft off my car. So, (laughs) right. uh, Right. They, they, they reel me in from a mile behind it. I look in my mirror. I I also have a camera set up to look in the back Mm -hmm. because my car vibrates. I have Lexan. So the mirror plus Lexan and the right kind of, sunlight you can't see anything Mm -hmm. so i also have a camera and i can't see them in my camera and i take a deep breath let it rev out shift a gear look down again and there they are and i'm like where did that guy come from and then they get right up on my bumper they pop out and drive right past me and i'm just like oh it's it's devastating so yep i can see that you're gonna have to get countermeasures well, I mean, part of the, some of the <laughs> things I'm working on this year is to smooth the air out on the car. So I'm not giving up any speed off the front end of my car that I don't have to. Mm-hmm. I may or may not remove the wing off my car to take drag off the back end. The, the back end's planted enough. I may not need it. I mean, just try to reduce as much drag as possible. Uh, I did make a final drive change historically no one runs six gear in these six speed Honda cars, but mm-hmm. I am. So I keep working on the theory. It's not far off. So a little, little lower gear will help me. So, and then you just got to get it to turn in. That's all. Yeah. Once I get turn in settled, I think it'll be a much faster car. So hmm. that should be fun. You yeah. could see that. So the hyperfest, what is it? Well, I just recorded with the event director, Chris Cabetto. Yep. It was fantastic. Uh, we'll be stealing him as a guest, by the way. Just sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely. You should. I don't know if he'll get as comfortable with you oh, as he, he did with me. I've known we'll him. Cookies. We'll get him. Yeah. Well, he's Italian. Send Go, meatballs. Like meat, we'll send meatballs. cheeses. Okay. Yeah. No problem. 
and if you're lucky, he makes like a great brittle fudge setup. So you should try to trade because okay, All right. always good. We can do that. <clears throat> so Hyperfest, and I'm sure Chris will tell you, but it was developed because he had started running NASA Mid Atlantic at the time. I think it was NASA Virginia. It was a new, new-ish uh, region, basically a franchise. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to drum up business. And he realized that, you know, racers are all older. We needed to get some youth in here, get them exposed to HPDEs. So the first one was, I think, 2001, 2002. And it featured a band and a DJ. And we did rollover contests and literally built cars to roll over and see how the person who flipped it the most times won. So ridiculous things like that. But did did they really win though? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) They they won a trophy. Funny story is um, the current NASA mid Atlantic photographer, Tony Politi, who is also the retired pace car driver. He built a car and he tried for three years to roll his car over. And on the third year, he actually got it to roll over. And I've never seen anyone happier in my entire life. (laughs) (laughs) He's out out high-fiving himself. (laughs) Basically. But, you know, we had the drifters. We had motorcycle stunt guys there. We had a car show. There was lots of stuff going on at at Hyperfest. In addition to racing, in addition to (laughs) HPDE. And that's also where what? NASA calls hyperdrive started. So for, I don't know what it is now, 40, 50, 60 bucks, you can get one classroom session and one session on track with an instructor. So that was a born at Hyperfest also. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of racers who started that way. What I like to call the go fast crack pipe, it bites hard. It's really addictive. So they get in the car the first time and they're not doing anything. And right. they, you know, they're not going nearly what most group one guys, most beginner guys are They're that when they go out, it's, it's painful, but they get hooked. And the next thing, you know, they're wandering. Those are the guys who are wandering in the paddock. You know, when the party's raging outside the paddock, these guys are walking through and go, Hey, I saw your car out there racing. Can you tell me about it? I have one of these, you know, and I'm like, Oh, those guys are there or, you know, somebody else that I race with has one of those cars. Let's go talk to him. And then we just bring people in the fold that way. Mm -hmm. But it's basically a gigantic party that the racers don't attend because we're busy all day. Oh, (laughs) Oh, okay. I get you. Yeah. My favorite. It's like a grid life fest kind of thing for those who are familiar with that. Right. Yes. Yes. It's a party where you're the feature. We're we're actually not the feature because on Facebook they only care about the drifters. Oh. We we put on a heck of a show last year in Honda Challenge. I mean a heck of a show. Nose to tail, 40 minute race. I mean, it wasn't getting closer. And nobody cared. But mm. that's not true. Because we had maybe a half a dozen kids who drove Hondas, saw us out there screaming them out to 9,000 RPMs that trickled through Saturday night. Mm. So they're the next generation and you got to reach them that way. Some of them only want to do drifting. That's fine. I know what my tire budget is. I don't know how drifters have a tire budget. They purposely destroy tires. I'm trying to go fast. (laughs) on them i'm not even mm-hmm. trying to like smoke them out on purpose but yeah so it's just a big party uh, the music's good fireworks this year i um, we recently when it moved to vir they do the coney downhill challenge so you basically get a power wheels take the the power modules out of it dress them up if you want to and you roll down the roller coaster at vir that's been really fun that's my I, kind of thing. We can do that. Yeah. So I bought a bunch of 
two or three years ago, I bought a bunch of winglets and cast offs from nine lives. And I turned a buggy into an Indy car and it was doing pretty well, except for they get death wobble. Mm-hmm. So oh, uh, we know the uh, death wobble. Yeah. So it can happen two ways. Either the wobble comes through the steering wheel or it doesn't. So your steering wheel is either wobbling excessively or your wheels are and nothing you do to the steering wheel changes that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you'll just spin out. That's a cheap thing. Well, that I will be uh, looking over my new build for this year to make sure that doesn't occur. I will be testing it at my own top secret downhill spot to make sure that it all works. Mm-hmm. And I will be adding more downforce. So, more oh. VIR, Miss Vicky. Yeah, VIR. We Still trying to... to get to VIR. Well, yeah, I let's prefer- go. I profess may be an excuse. We can do that. Yeah, there you go. All you right. You should go. Definitely you should go. Yeah. We'll be there. I think we need to uh we need to have a guest and we need to get uh what we need to do is we need to have our, our we need to steal your guest. And then okay. we need Vicky and Jennifer to be on at the same time and then they'll get all excited and then we'll go. That's what we need. Go. That's that's, that's, that's how that's Bill like, ropes us in all the work. time. That's exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just clear the calendar, Bill. Go yeah. go to the digital calendar and delete whatever's happening like the weekend before, that weekend, and the weekend after, mm-hmm. and then strategically place it in there. I, mean, I, I can neither confirm nor deny that such an event has happened already, but you know, it's, okay. it's you know. All right, sir, you are a data guy. You're a yep. data guy, professional, full-time. You're a data guy at the racetrack. What is your data program of choice at this point so i don't carry a laptop with me i have live in i live in a tent on an open trailer according to the german drivers the gts cars that are out there Mm -hmm. they drive by in the really really nice golf carts and say this is where the poor people live Mm -hmm. literally verbatim that's where i live yeah so that's always fun and then we run them out of there but or we do burnouts and pit bikes near their place, near their really <laughs> fancy RV at two in the morning. But normally I would say the aim is what you want, mm-hmm. but it really depends on what you need as a driver. So Miss mm-hmm. Vicky, you need aim in your car. Mm, yeah, we have aim. We got to get it all hooked okay. up. Bill, you have apparently after this last uh, dominating with Dawson, you must record throttle trace, please. Mm. Oh, with Miss Vicky? Yeah. With everyone. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking to break bad habits to dial in a car mm-hmm. from a driver who's super consistent, the aim is going to be your best bet. Mm-hmm. But there's a steep learning curve. Okay? Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, w- fidgeting well, around with the software is a, <laughs> is a pain. It it actually was for me. I I had to aim solo for a long time, and I I initially was using it just as a lap timer, and that's for a detriment. If you have an aim solo and you're not doing downloads, and w- what I implore people to do, and what worked for me, was compare your top two laps mm-hmm. and go find the delta. That delta is guaranteed because if it, if there's a delta there between your top two laps, that delta is there on every other lap too. So that's where you start and you can work backwards. Mm -hmm. But what it requires you to do is bring a computer, do downloads after every session and look at it and know what you're looking at. It's kind of hard with that. I sold off all of that for two reasons. I wasn't getting enough out of it. I was picking up time in between race events, not in between sessions. And I wanted to get faster and I wanted to get faster. Now my region also implemented a requirement for, uh, a race camera to be on at all times. Mm -hmm. And that was no fun. I hate GoPros. I can never make them work. Oh, you and me both. 
So they, they, I could get them to work about 50% of the time. And so I went with the Garmin Catalyst. It's all in one. I pull the tablet out, stay safe in the car. When weather happens, I pull it out. I check it after every session. They're from the, from the top view, you can learn a lot. And if you dig down, you can learn even more. And then if you export it, there, there's several new app companies out that will let you export data and they will translate it even more. But mm -hmm. one of the biggest bonuses is it tells you your top three areas that you can improve on immediately. Mm -hmm. All you do is press the button and it'll tell you. It will even tell you how consistent you are per lap. So your variability will be there. But, and one of the big things that it will do also is if your variability is very low, say under 1% and your projected best lap time and your actual best lap time mm -hmm. are the same or very, very close, you need to make drastic changes as a driver. It won't tell you where to make those changes, unfortunately, but what it, what it means is you're extremely consistent lap after lap after lap, and you need to make a change. You either need to grow up a little bit and go one car length past your braking zone everywhere on the track, or you need to change something. So it's a pretty insightful tool. Yeah. So that's what I use. That's what I currently use. And I wish it would have come out earlier personally. Yeah. And I do data every day, spreadsheets, data systems, data management. I do it all day, every day at a national level. And this little device gives me plenty of information to learn to drive faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we like ours. The only, I think the only thing we don't, we use it for HPDs. We haven't used it for a race yet. But our races are very long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you pr the camera would stop recording at some point, I would assume. Probably. Well, depending on your memory card. On your memory card. Yeah. But one of the things my my family, I have family all over the United States. I have family in Europe and Canada and Turkey. I have they're everywhere. And I'm really looking at that Sentinel system you guys keep talking about. Oh, yeah. Sentinel. So, yeah. It uh... cuz I need to live stream Oh, you want to live stream? Well, you know, yeah. we we uh, we had James on uh, long, might be two years ago, year at least a year ago, and uh, you know he sent us one over, and you know it's it's got the combination of multiple cameras, and then you can do the data integration live. So that was what attracted it to us. Yeah, so. I they're they're actually releasing two point oh. Yes. Cause I've been nerdy and researching everything it's on pre-order. So oh, I think nice. that's awesome. You can pre-order now. It, it's an expensive investment, but I have supporters all over. My family's really supportive and I can't tell you how many events I get text messages. Where's the live stream. Now I've tried to live stream. I tried my cell phone. I tried GoPro interface to the cell phone mm -hmm. using the cell phone as a hotspot. Nothing ever worked out. So I'm hoping that 2023 goes really well. So next off season, all I have to do is install my Sentinel system. So, well, if we ever get to the same track, we're going to have uh, three of them running on our cars so we can show you and give you a walkthrough and, and stop by and, you know, Worst comes to worst, you know, you get to go out there and try it yourself and see see what it does. The you're still kind of at the uh, you know, if there's poor cell coverage, the stream yeah. gets difficult. There's not a lot you can do about it. Like CMP is tough. There's just there's not a lot of cell coverage there. Um, NJMP is tough with uh Verizon, but if you do AT and T it's it's a little better. So but the you're still collecting the data. You're still collecting the video. You can, you can post it at a later point. You just won't have the live stream. So yeah, you I, I don't plan on posting my data one. Cause I don't need people to see it. And two, I don't need my family to freak out when they see that top speed. So 
So you just drive like us and don't worry about it. Our top speeds are fine. They're, they're like, you drive faster than that on the street. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I tried to follow Bill before. Yeah. <laughs> not, not back on the street. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like going to jail speeds. But, well, no, not me. I mean, the, the, th- <laughs> the thing I like about the Sentinel is, is you can have the data stream just to your paddock. And, and when we're doing an endurance race, that's an advantage for us because then we can sit there and we can watch everybody and and actually see what the what the data is saying and what the video is saying, right. and we we can actually coach through the radio. So that's that's something we're looking to take advantage of this year. And uh, yeah, we we will have uh, when Vicky's driving, I will not be on the radio. There is no no doubt. This guy, yeah. I don't mind you on the radio. This well, guy right here. I will. Not a, not a <laughs> Husband and wives don't do well with that. No, uh, it we, just doesn't work. We we tested it and proved it to be factually accurate that that is not the way to go <laughs> for us. So, yes. I was going to install a radio system. So my my first car was so unreliable mm-hmm. that I wanted to have a radio system in the car just so my wife, I could tell my wife, hey, I broke, but I'm fine. So mm-hmm. you didn't have to worry about me being in a wall or something. And she would say, was she it was an like, axle? And you say, yeah, basically. Yeah. And, but then I was like, well, if she's going to be on the radio, maybe she can tell me when there's full course cautions before they actually drop, mm-hmm. I'll get her a scanner. She can tell me when the green flag drops for beast of the East. Cause it's a rolling start mm-hmm. where we normally do standing starts. So I wouldn't need her for those, but the rolling starts, I really need to know because everybody's got a wing. You can't see it's terrible. And she was like, no, I'm not doing that. We don't communicate well in those types of situations. <laughs> we communicate well, but not in those situations. So. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Radios but- radios are huge, especially in endurance racing. Huge. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. They actually played a pretty big role at nationals last year. So uh, I believe John- it. Jonathan Baker had a guy on the radio standing up there on the hill. Mm-hmm. And he was able to call when the green flag or when the yellow flags were going to drop, you know? Yeah. That's a couple so, of free seconds, you know? Yeah. And, um, when things bunch up under yellow, you can, you need to take every free second you can get. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, blind apex podcasts are yeah. now available at all, all the podcast streamers, all of them. Finally. Finally, you got out of Apple jail. Yeah, I I got put in a special Apple jail. And I think everybody already decided they were just going to download Spotify and listen to it there. At least that's what my data says, which is another problem. I shouldn't have got into this podcasting thing. It helps my mental thing. You know, I I did it for my own mental health. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at the same time, I have another set of data to look at. So that's not so good. But it's the podcast data is channels are quite deep. I mean, you can get pretty deep. Now, I'm not mm-hmm. as international as you are. I have like I mean, Europe, uh, New Zealand, and mm-hmm. then the United States. Mm-hmm. I'm not nearly as international as you guys well, are. Though. I mean, you know, we we uh, we seem to be very popular in Ghana. Yeah, yeah. and Kenya, and Kenya. Yeah, so, and Kenya. So, figure- what made you start the podcast, and how did you come up with a name for that podcast? Well, the name of the podcast is named after South Bend at VIR. It is a blind apex. It was a challenge for me. And sort of just, it's the bl- a blind apex. Every, every track has one, but mm-hmm. you have to feel your way through it. And that's sort of the story of my racing career, sort of the story of me doing this podcast. So that's where the name came from. I got really, I won't say really good. I got good at South Bend. So, and I really love that corner. It it will separate the adults from the children on track. When you're there in a, in a school group, HPDE, you know who's pushing hard and who's not just by going through South Bend. So the reason I started it, in general was I have a roughly three to four hour commute three days a week. When I go into the office, I listen to lots of podcasts 
every time I listened to a podcast, I had more questions. Mm-hmm. And I oh, hate that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Jaime, why didn't you ask this question? It was the mm-hmm. perfect setup. Mm-hmm. And I do it uh, to myself. I'm like, Bill, you I, suck. Oh, absolutely. In the editing process, I'm like, can I splice this in somehow? I don't yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I just needed an outlet because what happened was I we COVID was over. The racing bug would really hit me. I was listening to more podcasts to get faster. There are like six GLTC podcasts and half of them feel like race recaps. So you listen to the same race recap six times and it kind of that kind of bothered me, but mostly mm-hmm. I needed it to think things out, to have discussions mm-hmm. um, and sort of distract me a little bit from the car, but also garner information for the car. So I think about on the way home while I'm listening to a podcast, oh, I like how this person asked this question or that question, or this is how I want to, this is more of the interview style I want to have or whatever, which is it's bogus. I, I, that all goes out the window and I press record, but it sort of distracts me, but then lets me refocus when I'm done with my commute. So I get right. to go home mm-hmm. and then I can focus on talking to somebody who wants to hear about racing or wants to talk about racing. And I stopped boring my wife to death with racing talk. So mm-hmm. that's sort of where it came from. Okay. So my friend Bill here is huge on goals. I'm kind what? of the Since oh jeez, like I'm the wing, right? Hey, this happened now. Let's do this, right? So, what are your goals for your podcast? That's a really good question that I probably should have written down somewhere because I'm more of a planner in that respect. Also, I've surpassed the actual goals that I set for myself already. Okay. I You're figured. only 12 episodes in, dude. That's good, man. Really good. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm okay. So I'm 12 episodes in at uh-huh. time of recording. Uh huh. Probably 13 or so, depending on when you release. Yep. I have a queue, which is more, I have more in queue than I thought I would mm-hmm. or plan to. That's and always, I actually like, always I like the pace. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to free me up a lot to work on the car, to have more fun at the track. I'm still debating on whether I buy one of those zoom P threes or P fours, whatever it is. And mm-hmm. then, uh, do some track side, mm-hmm. uh, stuff. Those might be rated R cause the boys get a little filthy potty mouthed when they, uh, at least they don't mm-hmm. come running naked through the podcast. Like Jeremy did. Hedge mail. Well, you know, there's that. You got <laughs> But so I had a goal of 25 downloads per episode. I'm above that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, when you look at the weird, at the data, it's so weird. I I can't tell you when people are going to download. It it just, I'm going to go download all of them and start listening to them because I drive almost three hours every day back and forth to work. So. Oh, if you're doing it five days a week, yeah, feel there you free. Go. Download and listen to me ramble and say um all, all the time. <laughs> but the other goal was for me to focus and learn, and I think I'm doing that. Mm-hmm. So personally, the podcast, it's seriously, it's a selfish endeavor. I don't care if nobody sponsors me. I will pay whatever the funds are that need to be paid so I can keep it moving because I'm learning I'm growing as a racer. I'm meeting amazing people. I'm making friends. And we all have that same passion and we all have the same desire to improve. And so that's really the overall goal. My podcast ends with uh, keep working on yourself, keep working on the car, let's get faster. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. That's what I want to do. I want to improve myself as a driver, as a human being, improve my mental health, my physical health, my capacity to learn, my ability to work on the car, those types of things. But I also want to become a better race car driver. Mm -hmm. And I want to 
have conversations and share experiences with folks to hopefully help them too. Because like I said, if the guys that are behind me are getting faster, if they learned more from the podcast than I did, I'm in trouble. So it was just another avenue to help people learn, to help everyone get faster because that was my goal was to get faster. So, sounds like you need to have Ronnie on your podcast as well. Yeah, probably one day. We'll see. Yeah. I, I'm we'll sure see Jeremy's a producer it. for you. He screws us around, but you know, whatever. That's fine. <laughs> I, I've already got a set. Don't you worry. <laughs> I'm pretty much solo. Um, uh, okay. But yeah. I have a friend in Racer who's been on my podcast already who really enjoyed it. So he'll probably be back. Uh, Jonathan Baker, he's been a guest on Jaime's podcast a lot. He mm -hmm. really enjoys podcasting, so he'll probably be on all the time. I I want to stay away from, hey, this is my race weekend recap, because you're not going to learn anything, not necessarily. If I didn't learn anything worth sharing, there won't be a race recap. Mm -hmm. There's right. no point in that. Um, if I learn something dramatic, something that was impactful, that I can talk to somebody else about mm -hmm. uh, that I think will help other people then sure. But yep. I'm going to try to take it, it. It's a long form one hour plus I got a two hour podcast out there now, but big, big I felt longer. <clears throat> yeah. I felt like Joe Rogan when we recorded that I was a little crazy, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I just, it's a long form content show and it's topic based. And that's, that's essentially what I wanted it to be before I bought any equipment. I wrote down, my wife said, you need one year of episodes. Mm -hmm. So I wrote down two. Yeah. Sure. And so without learning anything in between. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I'm in it for at least two years. Still, I run out of things to talk about. So good. Yeah. We have, uh, <sighs> what's the Dawson doc? Is it 113 pages of bullets? I don't know. It's, it's crazy. A yeah. It's a lot. We're going to be here for a while. It you needs to be edited down because we keep, I think we revisit some things. Yeah. So I, I have a spreadsheet and I have to remember not to write down titles to the podcast, but to write down topics for the podcast. Mm hmm. And I need to use common vernacular so I can control F and search to make sure it's not already there somewhere. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, it's a challenge. Vicky's control F on me is a totally different thing. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> not all the time. Just depends. <laughs> Just some of the time. What happened when I sent that one text last night about the, the mini that was available? I got a control life on that one. Uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. Give me a little bit more than that. <laughs> That's a different one than finding yeah. words. Yes. In a document. Yes. yes. Yes, that is a different one. So these these are all words that started with F. So okay. Know. Well, fantastic. Faster. No, no. That, 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 Not, none those of those. Were, those weren't them, were they, Jeremy? No. No. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, Con, it is always a pleasure. We've completed our home and home. Welcome back onto the podcast. Apparently, Jeremy's going to be uh, your booking agent and just screw us over, but that's fine. <laughs> hey, that's I, that's what I do. That's what well, I do. if you act fast, you can probably steal Chris Cabetto before his turn in rotation comes on my podcast. So we'll figure right, something out, sir. We're going to have yeah. to look him up. Yeah, no, book him. I, he was on 91 Octane. I didn't even know it popped up on. Oh, that's right. He was feed. on there. Yep. I, that, I, that was the one I listened to. Yep. Yeah. So now I have to listen to it to make sure he didn't drop the all the secrets that he gave me that I have to now edit out. So <laughs> don't worry. You'll get tired of editing. <laughs> yep. I don't edit. Oh, that's I right. Let her rip. That's right. You let her rip. Oh, very jealous about that. But this one I have to edit. So. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Very well. So if people want to keep up with you, if people want to keep up with the podcast, the best way is at the Blind Apex Podcast on Instagram. 
personally, if you have a eighth gen civic and you want to see what terrible decisions I'm making, that's at garage grade race car on Instagram. The podcast is on all the major platforms now. Now yes. that Apple decided to comply with my request. Uh, yeah. yeah. So cool. I'm out there. All right. And we will be following. And, uh, you know, if, yep. if you like our podcast at all, I think your podcast is, is one of the closest, different, but closest to ours, at least in terms of goals, you know, trying to help people learn and help people get better and, and yes. be somewhat entertaining about it. So I've enjoyed it. I even went, you know, Let's see, I downloaded. What did I download? I, I got tired of not being able to Spotify to go get yours. You were the only reason I have Spotify. You and my uh, wife downloaded just for me. I know. It's great. Know. Yeah. That's a great yeah. feeling, huh? It is. It is. So uh, thank you for coming on. We will bother thank you, you for again. having me. And, Absolutely. Uh, Anytime. Good luck this season. And uh, we will be talking again. Yeah. Great. I can't wait. <laughs>